Now I would like to present uh, the next speaker, whose name is Ian Cooper. He's a polyglot coding uh, architect from London. He's a founder of London.net users group. He's a speaker, tabletop gamer, geek. He's a tattooed, pierced, and bearded. The gov on brighter command. So Ian, the virtual stage is yours. Hey everyone, thanks very much. Um, okay, and well, I'm here today to talk to you about what we call capability mapping. And really that's about how we um, slice up our estate into microservices. And the reason I give this talk is because when you go and look at a lot of the white papers around microservices, say for example, Fowler's and Lewis's, they refer to this idea of aligning your microservices with your business capability. But it's very hard out there to find any information on what that is. What does that mean, right? Um, and so really, this is a kind of journey into describing what that means and how you actually go around partitioning your estate into microservices. Who am I? This is mostly dull. I've got grown my beard. I've been doing this for a while. Um, I work on an open source project called Brighter, that's Brighter Calm. Um, and we're always looking for new contributors. We also have a version in Python, for those of you that Python devs called Brightside. Um, check us out uh, and feel free to come and join our, our, our group. Okay, what's the agenda? So we'll talk a little bit about this notion of microservices as an enabler for changing the way we work to move towards a kind of product focus rather than a project focus. We want to avoid lots of collaboration between teams and having to coordinate their delivery schedules, et cetera. We'll get into this idea that microservices is componentization via services, and what does that really mean in terms of the actions we want from a microservice, and how would that affect how we think about partitioning our space for them? And then we'll get into the meat of the talk, which is really this idea of organized around business capabilities. Okay. We probably won't get much into a section around independent operability. Okay, products, not projects. What do we mean by that? So uh, Adrian Cockroft, who at Netflix pioneered this idea called fine-grained SOA, which is really very close to what we today think of as microservices came up with this phrase, speed wins in the marketplace. And what his assertion was, was that um, more and more we like, live in a world where uh, the, 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 the entry standard has become continuous delivery, your team finishes a story, it can essentially drop that out immediately to your customers. And that if you are essentially not releasing multiple times a day, you will be outcompeted by people who are. And that the old school model where essentially you looked at, you know, releasing once a month was no longer the kind of cadence you needed. And the Netflix really invested in fine grained SOA, as they called it, because it was a way to achieve that kind of velocity. When we think about the kind of old school model of uh, a kind of monolith based development, right, this is kind of how I experienced that a lot in the past. So we had a monolith and we have multiple teams working on that monolith. And in order that we don't trip over each other, we probably essentially create a, a branch or a fork of the code base that's ours to go and work on. And then at a certain point we decide, well, we're going to go and do a release now of everything we've been building. We'd like to get that out the door. And optimistically, let's say that effectively at the end of every two week iteration, my team wants to release everything they've been worked on and has now done done that iteration. Quite often in these environments, you find it's longer than that, more like about every you know, two iterations, about once a month. And as I then go in to try and uh, release my monolith, I find that a number of other teams are also at the same point. They've reached the end of their iteration and they want to release the work that's done done. So we're all now queuing up to merge into the, into the monolith. And the first thing that kind of happens is we spend a little bit of time fixing all the merge conflicts, talking amongst each other, saying, well, why did you change this? Why did we change that? And eventually that kind of settles down after a couple of days. We now have a good version of the code we can build. And then of course it's a regression test everything. We've all put changes in, you've put changes in, who knows what, what's working. And that tends to lead to this problem where regression testing starts throwing up errors. Now we then get into the world of plausible deniability. It's not my team's fault, it's your team's fault that that particular thing is broken. 
And quite often I've seen, uh, you know, triage in the morning where we try and figure out what was broken in the test that the, the testing were running yesterday. Someone's job is to try and figure out, well, which team should that be assigned to? And this process continues day by day as we kind of struggle our way through the errors in this particular release. Then tends to what happen is, you know, hard discussions around, well, your software is not easy, obviously not ready. Is it about a feature flag? Can we turn it off? Do we have to roll your code back? Um, and then we essentially come up with what is actually going to make it out into the next release, retest that, and eventually we ship it. But I often find that process between the point where we say we are done, done, and the point we say we can get code out of the door in the monolith world is quite often about two weeks. And this creates basically a self-fulfilling prophecy, a feedback loop, because now from the point that I started working on a story to the point the customer actually sees, that tends to be about four weeks. So realistically, I'm actually only dropping my, my changes out once every month. And that creates more pressure on me that when a release window comes up, I want to get into that particular release train because um, it'll be quite a long wait if I don't. And that tends to mean that teams get close to the done done and they say, oh, kind of we're good enough to go. We'll drop our code into the release everybody else and we'll kind of fix the code as the bugs come up in the release um, uh, regression testing and we'll be, and we'll be out the door. And that tends to lead to uh, even longer kind of release windows. And some of them then drag on for ages and we all throw our hands in the air and say, you know, why can't we ship software here? So microservices, essentially, one of their main goals is to fix that problem, right? Microservices have lots of other benefits, but those benefits come from any form of componentization. One of the reasons we want to use microservices is we want to move to a model that looks a lot more like this, right? In this model, every team essentially has an independently deployable service that it can ship without reference to any other teams. I can ship almost as soon as I've released a, re released a store and so it's done, done. If there's a problem with it, I can probably ship it again quite quickly. Um, I can really move towards ideas that say, you know, some stuff is better tested in production because it's a distributed system. I'm always gonna find problems in production. And my release cadence becomes much faster. I can literally think about shipping, you know, in hours rather than essentially in weeks. And it's that speed that we get. And one way I tend to like to think about it, that is this. We went away and built agile methodologies like extreme programming. And we realized, unfortunately, that they only tend to work from, say, teams that are less than 12, and optimistically probably more like about four to seven people. And those teams are capable of shipping code very fast. But as our organization scales, if we actually need more than about four to seven people to ship code, the problem becomes, how do we coordinate all those agile teams? And there are various solutions around kind of scaled agile approaches, but a much simpler way is simply to say, we want loads of in small agile teams that can ship entirely independently than any other teams. We preserve agility because we say, hey, you're an agile team, this is what you build. And that's this notion that independent deployability will lead, it, which is the idea we can make a change to microservice and deploy into production environment without having to utilize any other services. That notion means because I'm not dependent on you, I can effectively switch into what we call product mode. And in product mode, my microservice has its own backlog, prioritized by business value, probably controlled by a product owner. Uh, it may be related to the OKRs that the organization have that are filtering down through the uh, head of product into the individual product managers that say, we can change this portion of what we do and we can continue to iterate and add value quite independently of what anybody else in the organization is doing. And we don't want to be so much in program mode where essentially we say in order for this thing to earn value for us, a number of teams will have to ship something. Because program mode requires coordination, it leads to inventory waste because I've made my change, it's all ready to go, but I can't ship it and you know, earn value from it from customers until you're ready to. And often we talk about the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, right? 80% 80 of our time ought to really be in product mode, only 20% time of our, of our time should be dealing with projects. Okay. But how do we get there, right? And what is a suitable microservice boundary if we want to start talking about product mode? So what microservices are essentially doing is looking at using a componentization model 
and basing that on services. So I've been around in software for a while and I can remember a whole set of different strategies we've used over time for componentization. You know, I started my career back in the 90s in kind of com, um, uh, and then we moved into decom and com plus, we got distributed. So we'd run basically, we started out with com components, which are components that we could basically have independently. We started out running those in process and then we started out moving those out of process. Com was, and decom particularly, was difficult to get working. And uh, Don Box, who was essentially one of the kind of people we always listened to about Com, went away and built a simpler version, which worked by just using HTTP to allow you to do remote method invocation on a server, which became which was a simple object access protocol, SOAP, which created web services. Web services were essentially leveraging HTTP to create, say, let's say, well, I'll do RPC over HTTP instead of doing it by some um, proprietary binary protocol which allowed us to sort of interop with different languages. And it turned out that SOAP version one was great, but we had lots of uh, distributed balls of mud because of the type coupling all of these from RPC services were giving us. So we created SOAP uh, SOA2 around this, which is basically using events. But both of these were kind of SOA journeys. Right? And then we discovered that the vendors got involved. They created a thing called an enterprise service bus, where effectively everything talked to everything else through this centralized component. We got vendor lock-in, we got spaghetti being shoveled under the floor and identified service bus, and someone called Jim Weber came along and said, we've lost our way. It's much simpler than that. What we need is basically just services to talk to other services using lightweight protocols like REST or lightweight messaging uh, middleware like Rabbit and Q. And he called this movement Gorilla SOA. And Gorilla SOA is really the foundation of the idea behind microservices of smart endpoints and dumb pipes. The idea is that the middleware we or the transport that we're using to connect our, our microservices shouldn't hold any of our business logic. It should just be a dumb pipe down which we push stuff and all the logic should live in our microservices at the edge. And the microservices are really taking that SOA idea, a Gorilla SOA idea in particular, and then coupling it with DevOps and some ideas from domain driven design and munging it all into this new practice. The reason that's important is it's worth understanding that this is a continuation. So lots of the understanding we have of how you do componentization remains true. And we can think about the four tenths of SOA when we think about a microservice, right? Boundaries are explicit. Essentially, we should have an API of some sort that restricts access to the internals of our microservice. When we say API, we may mean HTTP, but we could mean gRPC, we could be MQP to Rabbit, we could be doing SQS on, on Amazon, we could be doing Kafka. It doesn't really matter, but the idea is that the boundary is quite explicit. It's an API. The only way to get hold of our data is to essentially go through our API to access it, right? And the reason for that on the far side is this notion that services are autonomous. We want to be able to deploy completely independently of somebody else, so they shouldn't have any hooks into our interior, because if we change our details, then none of the other services around us should have to change. And that also leads us to these ideas like share scheme and not type. We want to share things like JSON or XML definitions of our API, not be sharing things like a .NET assembly or a JAR file, which essentially couple you again. Right? Compatible by a policy at the top just means we may have to have standards like OAuth as the way that we uh, arrange our API, so things like security. But overall, the idea is to say our services work. We want independent deployability. We make them autonomous. We put them behind an API. And we require this idea of common closure, right? This idea that says our product manager wants to be able to deal with a set of changes to the product um, that effectively can be confined to one microservice. So our boundary needs to be something that the product team can relate to. It just can't be a, a purely technical boundary we want to use inside. And they need to be stable. Okay. It'd be stable because somebody's going to depend on API, we suppose it's on a perimeter from our domain saying, this is how you deal with this particular concept in our domain. And it needs to be stable because internally between our microservices, if we're using events as a communication protocol, that's still an API that essentially we don't want to change too frequently. So we really want to create partitions that are stable, have common closure um, and between them. So how do we get to that idea, right? This idea that basically what we want is strong cohesion. Okay, so that's it. 
Yeah, so we tell a structure is stable if the cohesion is strong and coupling is low. Now, low coupling, I've talked about in other talks that I've done. You can see me out there on, say, YouTube talking about event driven collaboration. So, low coupling is really about using events between our services, using things like REST, basically our perimeter. And that helps give us stability. But we don't often talk about the other half here, which is strong cohesion. And that's what effectively we need to get this partition and closure stuff sorted. And that's where really this idea of organized around business capabilities comes in. So organized around business capabilities is part of the microservice definition that Fowler and Lewis originally came out with. So Fowler and Lewis's definition is really the first one to um, popularize the term microservices and try and define it. What they said was the microservice approach to the division is different, splitting up into services organized around business capability. So they've given us explicit advice. They've said this partitioning strategy that will work is a business capability. And actually, that's a term that SOA used regularly for division of services into business capability. What does that mean, right? You go and search out there on Google, what does business capability mean? How do you actually do this piece of work? So um, back in the day when we talked about SOA, when we talked about this notion of business capability and what SOA alignment was, um, Nikolai Gisettis wrote this. He said, a service should represent a self-contained functionality that corresponds to a real-world business activity. Right? So what are services should be a business activity? That makes sense because that gives us some alignment, therefore, with product and common closure around changes. Right? And processes, which are performed in different steps, basically called activities or tasks. So processes are the thing we're trying to look for, business processes that essentially represent some kind of activity we want to align our service with. And that's this idea that SOA is aligned to a process. What do I mean by a process? So a process quite often is something that our organization does that can be described as a verb or an app. Like, for so example, we make lunch for customers or we prepare a bill for a customer. And a capability is kind of how we deliver that now. So the catering capability delivers on make lunch. It may also deliver on make breakfast and um, make dinner and make tea, right? Um, and the accounting department delivers on prepare bill. It may also basically deliver on things like you know, prepare end of year accounts. Capabilities are how we deliver a process. Okay? And the capability would include things like um, IT, which therefore means essentially things like a microservice. Right? So we talk about aligning with business capabilities. What we mean is our microservices are delivering, a pro are delivering processes for us. And usually we tend to align our microservice with a process sometimes with an activity that's a bit lower than a process, and we'll show you that in a second. So how do we find the processes, right? Now we're saying, like, we're saying basically we're aligned on business processes. So what do we mean by them? What, what is a process? How would you know what one is? Is there a place you can go to find out about them, right? So one of the most uh, common techniques that businesses use for finding processes is called value stream mapping. It's particularly common if people in your organization are doing things like Six Sigma. Um, and uh, a value stream basically is the sequence of activities required to design, produce, or deliver a good or service to a customer, right? So what we're trying to say is I want to deliver, I have a, I have a user journey, a customer journey, essentially in my organization, where they'll interact and get some value out of my service, and I want to map how we do that. So this process called value stream mapping is pretty well understood. A lot of it comes from industry, but you can apply it to software. The first thing you do is you have you have some kind of kickoff meeting, and you're going to decide in your kickoff meeting what it is you're going to actually map. But you're not trying to map the world, trying to boil the ocean. You want to map a specific way that you give value to customers, so some kind of customer journey. So we're going to look at an example in a second. We're going to look at an example of what's called the guest cycle in hospitality, which is where somebody wants to basically book a hotel room, stay in the hotel, and then pay for their stay in the hotel. Okay. So we'll look at that. That's how we give value to a customer. We give them a hotel room. We give them refreshments. Um, we give them a beer to drink in the bar. If you can remember, if you remember going to hotels, that thing that used to happen in the past. Okay. So the first thing you do is quite often called, I think, go to the Gemba or you walk the floor. So essentially you say, well, what is? can we kind of figure out how this process works? Can we go and visit this and do it ourselves and kind of walk through the steps? Because that will tell us essentially what we think the processes are. And what you do to find processes is you look 
for the way you kind of get handoffs between things that happen. I'm going and I'm doing something, then that stops and results maybe in an artifact, like a piece of paper or a hotel room door key, and I go and do the next thing. And what we're looking for in terms of granularity is usually about five to 15 things, an average customer kind of journey that represent those kind of steps. Less than five, probably we're not being granular enough. More than about 15, we're being much too granular. That's really down to a task level, not really a process level. And then effectively, what we do is we go and uh, map that out. So we go and basically get a piece of last piece of butcher paper. We go and get a Miro board nowadays because we're virtual. Um, or you go and get a whole lot of post-it notes and you stick them on a wall. And what you're trying to do is say, I want to map out that journey in terms of the process steps so we can talk about it in a group. So here you can see what we do to put at the top, the customer, we put the person effectively who this value stream is providing value to. And on the left-hand side, we're gonna start putting basically notes of the processes that we think are happening, right? So the customer is gonna try and effectively find some way of getting a room to reservation. They're gonna try and make some booking with us. And we're also writing down here what we think of the departments, which are essentially probably well aligned to what we might think of as capabilities, are they dealing with these? Then effectively, we're gonna have some step where we actually then choose to check in to the hotel then we occupy the space effectively of a room. When we do that, um, occupancy will include things like, you know, having one of those Toblerone bars for the mini bar because it's late and I got hungry. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, ordering some room service in, uh, effectively, or going down to the bar, having a drink with some friends and putting it on the bill. That will include things like occupancy. Then essentially when I finish my hotel stay, I'll check out and I want to pay my bill uh, for all of the ch outstanding charges. Okay. Then what you do is you walk backwards. And when you walk backwards, you kind of look at the art and the art, what's the final thing that I get produced as the customer? Where does I see the value at the end? In this case, um, for example, it might be I look at the bill. I as a customer now have a bill for my stay and I've got a whole lot of items on it, like my, my bar bill, my room service bill, things in the mini bar. Um, things that I'm entertained, entertained in the hotel services and my room uh, and the occupancy rates and how long I stayed, etc. And then what we do is we say, well, where did all these bits of information come from, right? How did these things appear on my bill? And so we can track back and begin to look at the processes that may have caused that, right? Now, it may be that when we begin to do that, we'll also get, get a view on other things that we're not mapping right now that are kind of out of scope. So typically, for example, when I start to think about, well, I ordered food in a restaurant during my occupancy and someone put that on my bill, I may begin to wonder, well, how did the restaurant get food that essentially I'm ordering? And really, that's another whole value stream. Okay. So be careful about um, going too far. You just build multiple value streams to get the whole picture. When you do the second one, the other thing you tend to look for in classic value stream mapping is how long does it take to do? What's the elapsed time for the job? What's the lead time? How long am I queuing or waiting? So you can imagine a check-in desk. Basically, I turn up to the check-in desk and some people in front of me, there's only a certain number of people actually working, so a number of staff, which I also want to record. Um, and then effectively, you may say, well, it takes you in a minute to check in, but it was waiting five minutes, right? And then generally, you put all those details into a map and you say, I want to put in details about basically the time it takes and the number of staff involved. And then we can kind of draw that up. And you probably find if you use any kind of templating drawing tool like Visio or Drawio, you will probably have, even though you may not have ever, ever played with it, um, uh, diagramming uh, icons for doing value stream mapping. Right? Now you can go away and look at those and know what those are. Um, and essentially, you've got a name of a set of processes. You've effectively tell, you record the elapsed time and the process time, the number of things that complete successfully. So for example, it may be that I I start the process of investigating your hotel, I get to the booking process and I don't complete the booking. Maybe I looked at the rate, I didn't like it. So you can kind of see um, where, where maybe we're basically losing customers. And that gives us overall a proper value stream map. Now, the thing is from the point of view of software is we're not using value stream mapping for its traditional process often when we do this. The traditional reason why people do value stream mapping something like Six Sigma is I want to optimize this flow, I want to reduce waste. So I might say, hey, I need more people in the check-in desk because I want to reduce the amount of time people are waiting in order to get through this flow, right? We don't really need that. So quite often we can end up just simplifying this. Um, oh, by the way, you told me, flag, 
the processes, right? That's what we're talking about earlier. Those are the things that we're aligning probably microservices to, right? So effectively, when we think about things like, you know, booking and reservation, et cetera, those are the things that are candidate microservices. But we can kind of like take the guest cycle, we can probably simplify it and say, okay, well, those are the processes we care about modeling. We can also then effectively, from our point of view, so maybe it'd be useful for us to understand activities, activities here too. So sometimes I quite often find that a process is too coarse-grained for a modern view of microservices, that we may have, you know, we are very successful now as a um, company that makes hotel software. And generally speaking, we'd like a single team to be working on an individual microservice so that we can align them to a backlog. And we're so successful, we want more than five teams of about four, people, four or seven people working on it. We want double the number of teams. And to do that, um, I'm going to need to basically look at activities, which I want to go down. So I might begin to look at the activities. What are the things that I do in each of those steps? Right? And I can kind of break down how networking works. Oh, by the way, always just for a caveat, saying I've never worked in the, hotel in, in the hospitality industry in terms of hotels, so I don't really know anything about it. Please don't rush away and try and build your entire microservice architecture based on this slide that you're seeing here, because it may well be wrong. Um, uh, it is, this is a fiction to show you how it works, but it could be true. And you'll also notice sometimes when we map out those activities, we can see some correspondences, right? That actually users are performing the same activity in um, different process steps, and then maybe actually better candidates for microservices, right? I would tend to start with your process map as a good starting point and then figure out that's my kind of minimum spread. Um, and then if you've got more teams that you need to give work to, you can start saying, well, actually, I could probably refine out some commonality here. All right, that's one approach. Um, one of the things to be aware of what we're trying to achieve here by aligning the processes as well as the benefits we're going to get around being able to uh, align for common closure, so getting essentially the product focus from an individual project manager around how we do check-ins, how we do reservations, um, how we do occupancy of the room, right? The other advantage we're going to get is when we're going to avoid building entity services. So entity services occur when I have a service that's wrapped around some data. So for example, a room or, um, uh, a, uh, or effectively my, my fridge in, in my room for room service, right? And then essentially what happens is all the interesting business logic bubbles up and some kind of orchestrator that says, oh, during occupancy, I need to keep calling all these services to record crowd-like details in them, right? That's just a distributed board of mud. That isn't actually microservices. What we want is essentially to have processes that can handle individual parts of, the, parts of our work and essentially then raise events to tell other services about things that have happened. So it's easy enough, right, this model to understand I make a reservation, I raise an event, um, that gets stored basically in the, in the check-in system as a reservation on this date. When I come to do check-in, I can see you've got a reservation. Great, when you do check-in, I can check you in, I can tell the occupancy that now we should start clicking the clock on the bill, et cetera, right? That's much easier with this model. You can begin to move away from the whole um, entity service model. And the, this idea of entity services as an anti pattern comes from Michael Nygaard, and it's mentioned on his blog. And so we have this idea that effectively overall, what happens is we do value stream mapping across our organization for different things where we add value to customers. And that gives us a whole picture of our organizational, uh, if you like, catalog of processes. Now we may get lucky. We may get lucky and actually rather than have to do this work ourselves, we can find an off the shelf model. So I think people like APQC essentially is an organization which provides you with off the shelf process models. Um, you can start with their very generic model that is kind of like for all industry sectors. They then refine that for a number of industry sectors, right? And you pick one that's close to you and essentially you then figure out what's your divergence on that. So you can get a head start on a lot of this stuff and you can kind of use standardized process descriptions. Okay, if you're all starting to value stream mapping, then there are other alternatives. So out of the DDD community comes event storming by Berta Brandolini. So this is a kind of like overall picture of what event storming tries to generate, right? So the Focus on that little orange diagram saying domain event. We start with mapping domain events, right? And then we we look at the commands, which you can see to the left of that, which have caused that event by operating on an aggregate or an external system. That, com that command itself was probably caused by a user. You can see that on the far right-hand side, who issued a command, um, probably because they 
interactive with the UI, had a look at the, a read model, which is built from events that told them what was in that UI, told them what choices they could make. When they made those choices, it resulted in an event. And it might sometimes be that effectively we need to have some policy that sits between an event and that, right? It's not going to be a whole talk teaching how to do event storming. I just want to give you an idea of how we would use event storming to find boundaries. You can go away and figure out other talks and uh, Alberto's book to find out how you do event storming. Similar kind of model, though. We agree what it is we're going to go and look at. We do a phase called chaotic exploration where we essentially go away and put out all the events. So we put all the events that we think of. So this is the same thing represented basically for event storming, just the guest lifecycle basically for check-in, right? And I'm not going to run these through all the steps because they could equally be wrong, but you can see actually there's a few different things in here about basically printing keys, et cetera, that may show up for us. It's a slightly different level of granularity. What we're doing here is called a big picture event storm rather than a detailed one where effectively we're looking far more for what are the boundaries between pieces. And having done that, essentially we go and add systems and people. So we go and say, well, we need to add commands here that generate those events. We need to add actors that basically the people that are creating those events or external systems or timers that are firing those the firing events off, right? What causes those events to happen? And then aggregates the data it actually operates on or policies, decisions that we're making. And that might look a bit like this, right? So you can see I've got blue kind of commands operating in a kind of yellow aggregate, resulting in a orange kind of event, right? And we organize them roughly left to right in a kind of timeline that's showing what we think the, think, think the flow looks like for a user coming to do a guest check-in, okay? And again, don't worry about the detail. I know nothing about the hospitality industry, so you can probably disregard whether this is accurate or not. Just get an idea for what we're doing, right? Having done that, essentially, we then do this kind of walkthrough where effectively we say, hey, what's the kind of scenarios we can think of? Let's walk through showing effectively how those commands and events would work. And we generally find problems and holes we have to fill by saying, oh, we need an event here, or a command here, or an aggregate here. Then we do the same thing we do for value stream mapping in a sense that we basically walk it from the rear. We say, hey, here's the bill. How did I get that? And then we walk backwards trying to figure out um, uh, how we got there. And often that's very useful phase for figuring out I need a read model here um, because someone has made a decision and we're effectively via a UI and where did I get the data that that came from? And that means it must be an event somewhere. Let's raise that so I could see it. Generally, we have that, we can begin to look for boundaries. One thing that's quite common is people look at the data, look at the aggregates, and they say, hey, the aggregates essentially could represent potential boundaries and microservices because those aggregates represent things where we're operating on the same data. And that is useful, but it really represents the minimum thing that essentially it would, uh, uh, would be a microservice. In other words, I couldn't get any smaller than that because these things operating on the same data probably mean that they want to point, that they want to share basically something to be deployable. And there are ways around that. We may choose at some points to say, actually, this is probably got to copy the data that's read only, doesn't like it, just reads it. So that doesn't necessarily actually depart the same microservice. What we're often, I do tend to do and look at this more is say, well, where there's an event, there's a potential handover point. Maybe I can look and see what I think are activity boundaries here. And quite often as I walk through this with a team, we'd be asking, okay, there appears to be a clear activity here, which is occurring around making a reservation. And we will just draw lines around that to say, this all appears to be some kind of one, one microservice. Right. So it's just another way of effectively giving us candidates, right? Things that essentially we think could be microservice boundaries. And it gives us a kind of smallest, a small, no smaller than this kind of model, right? And kind of the, you have to be at least this size to ride, but you could be bigger if we want them to be. And to some extent, you're always guided a little bit by teams. Microservices, don't forget, are really about um, uh, scaling our, enterpri our, our enterprise to basically get more teams able to work together. So sometimes we come up with questions that say, well, this area of the application, we could divide that clearly in terms of activities into two things. It doesn't look as though we're splitting the data in a way that's weird, right? And you could actually have a copy of that. That'd be fine. Um, but actually, we've only got one team here. So there's not necessarily any value for us right now in splitting that into two microservices. But what can be helpful is you think about how you build it such that essentially you say, you know, in the, we want to build this so that essentially we don't get a direct dependency on this data from this part of our service such that we can split that more easily in the future. We're going to look at it. We're, we're never going to read. We're never going to write to that bit from here. 
they will use a view so that we over the database or something like that, or just a read only copy so that we can figure out we're not going to actually um, bind ourselves into the schema such that we can slice it out when we become more successful and this team needs to split this microservice apart. And overall, one of the things to bear in mind is that repartitioning may well occur continuously as you scale up or down your organization size. Okay, we often hear people talk about this idea of bounded context and say bounded context are what we should use in microservice boundaries. There's a little bit, there's a couple of, a couple of problems there. The first problem is what is where we use bounded contexts, right? So bounded context by domain driven design, I just really says it's a diagnostic tool for a way of looking at our application and dividing it up into, into clusters. And they're clusters where effectively we see there's a team that owns a code base and some database schema. But domain driven design itself in its bounded context is a diagnostic approach. It's saying, I want to look at this. It doesn't give you any way of creating or finding bounded contexts. And so really what the that exists is what event storming is trying to do is help you find the bounded context without, without building any software. The problem with bounded context is that, is that the notion of context mapping, which is an activity you do to find bounded contexts, tends to be saying it works against existing software and it's diagnostic and it maybe says, actually, you've got some terrible bounded contexts, um, which are basically going to cause you pain and they invite you to fix them. The advantage of something like event storming is it says, hey, you can create something that looks like basically the way we would build software. And then I can say, what happens if I basically drew my bounded context here? What would that look like? Okay. So you need something like effectively event storming as a, as a tool to find bounded context before you build software. Because the problem is that although a microservice is a bounded context, it's got some code, it's got some data, it's got some database schema and it has a team organized around it, right? So it fulfills that definition. So effectively, um, and, and we do CI there, but we have a continuous integration boundary and we have ubiquitous language, we, we speak the same language about the bits inside. So is a monolith, right? A monolith is just a really big bounded context, okay? Nothing says, that's a problem. We do CI, we've got own data, we own code, we potentially treat it as one CI boundary, okay? It's a bad bounded context because effectively we're going to have problems that everyone basically located inside it, but it's a bounded context, right? So you can't, when people talk about saying, oh, just petition according to bounded context, it's kind of like, yeah, but how do I find those? And what you're really saying is go away and do event storming and find some, touch some candidate bounded contexts that I think I want to get towards. All right. Okay. So that's the that. I, we may have five minutes, I believe, to have a yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, are there any questions? So uh, if there's no questions, maybe what we can do a little bit is talk uh, a tiny bit about uh, yeah. this independent deployability. One of the things to bear in mind when you're building a microservice that's aligned to a process is that you won't necessarily have one um, process as in basically a operating system process delivering that. So one of the problems we see out there today is people have got from uh, some communities like DevOps, the notion that a microservice is just something that runs in a Docker or container or a pod in Kubernetes. And that's not a good definition. Microservices are not about the granularity of deployment. Microservices are about the granularity which enables us to have a team working with a backlog based around a product that basically depends on our organizational size and how we need to partition our software to achieve that kind of agility. Inside an individual microservice, right inside this boundary, I effectively have a number of things. I'll certainly probably have something that stores data that, in, that essentially is running in its own process. I certainly have something that probably is dealing with a perimeter based API for synchronous like HTTP or GRC. And I may have something that's working asynchronously, uh, doing basically reading messages off the queue. Because I want to scale that HTTP endpoint differently to the one that's reading the same example messages off a queue, because one is about making sure my queue doesn't have high latency, 
you know, I was about making sure that my people using my product have high latency. I would probably have separate processes from them for them, right? Separate operating system and processes. So a microservice may consist of more than one process, right? And certainly, effectively, that may mean that effectively, if I have a, an alignment of a single process in a container, that would be more than one container, right? And that's quite challenging for some people because they have become wedded to this idea that there is a strict mapping between um, containers and microservices. And that is not true because that doesn't give you the benefits of microservice organizationally around improving agility and productivity. You'll get your adding complexity and cost without, without getting returning value, right? And Fowler and Lewis call this out explicitly in their original paper. They said that the view that a microservice represents one operating system process is naive, and, they, and most of them will actually consist of many, right? So that's just worth calling out. That is basically a kind of bad um, description of microservices that's circulating out there when you talk about how you partition stuff. All right. That's probably the only point I wanted to call out, um, given we've got a few extra minutes, no questions. We Thank you, Ian, so much. We really, we're very happy to have you this year at Build Stuff. And before we went live, you mentioned that this is your favorite conference to be, and you really miss it this year. I, so I'm hopefully, so sad that I'm not in Vilnius. It feels like I don't even know Christmas is going to be happening because it's kind of like my thing that tells me Christmas is about to happen. And I get to eat fantastic food at prices that I mean it's really affordable. To me, um, and it's like I just want to be in Vilnius, really. So I'm very, very sad this year. My heart is broken. Um, but never mind. Well, next year, next year, vaccines. Next year. Fingers crossed.